Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Now, some people are going to be a little bit disappointed what I'm just about to say. This is the beginning of the end. Now, that doesn't mean to say I'm going to not do any more videos. It just means to say that I think I've reached a point where I've achieved one of the major goals that I set when I first got this machine four and a half, nearly five years ago now. This is a very, very cheap machine, and you can still buy them today for anything from $1,200, $1,500, something like that. In the form that they arrive at you, they're okay, but they're, they're cheap for a reason. Mechanically, they're pretty sound, and in fact, this I think is a very, very good base machine for anybody wanting to start off with their proper laser engraving career. Now, I don't mean to be insulting when I say that, you know, the K40 is a great little machine and it's very, very cheap, but it's not what I class as a proper machine. It's not a digitally controlled machine and you can't do that many things with it. This is a mini version of all the machines that go up to huge standard sheet machines. The principles of this machine and the control system are all exactly the same. It's just that it's miniaturized. Now, in essence, it's a very good machine, but there are lots of problems with it that I have discovered. It's cheap for a very good reason in that the mechanics of it are nothing like a proper CNC machine. This is more like an oversized inkjet printer. I'm being honest. <laughs> but, as I've discovered, there are some great redeeming features of this machine. And why I say that I've reached the end of the road is because with the few significant but not expensive changes that I've made to this machine, I know it's a bit of a broad claim, but I would say that I've reached a point now where this cheap little piece of Chinese pieces, what I class as a do-it-yourself kit that arrives ready assembled. But what you have to do is put the quality control into the job. Now, this machine is now beginning to compete with those very, very expensive machines in terms of its performance. Now, the quality of the parts in here will never match those of the expensive machines. But hey, it does the same job, almost. Now in terms of engraving, those machines work at a thousand millimetres a second. I know I can get this one up to about seven or eight hundred millimetres a second. So it's in the right ballpark, and that's as far as engraving is concerned. But when it comes to cutting, power is the only thing that really matters. And you can't cut fast. You can only cut as fast as your power will allow you. So speed has no benefit at all when it comes to cutting. My goal has always been to try and understand this technology, to try and understand why there's a big difference in the performance of these machines as opposed to the expensive machines. Well, I think I've come to the conclusion that I do understand it. I've spent a long time understanding the technology and I've spent a long time trying to understand the mechanics of this particular little machine. And in the last few sessions you've seen several interesting sets of results that I've achieved with this machine. Now, when you own a Chinese laser machine, you have to understand the technology. When you own a very expensive machine, you don't have to understand the technology. The so-called professionals have supposedly understood the technology and built all their skill and knowledge into menus. So you become very good at selecting and pressing buttons and choosing menus, but never actually understand what the technology is all about. Now that's been my goal through the last four or five years, to try and educate myself and at the same time drag you along with me. Now, I've got a very clear understanding of how this technology works now. And when I look at some of the demonstration videos for these uh, expensive machines, I clearly can see that A, the designers of the machine 
did not understand the technology fully and b the users of those machines that are selling it again do not understand the technology they understand how to use their machine and a lot of the demonstration videos only show you the end result they don't show you the machines working in progress now there are one or two videos that allow you to see what's actually going on and if you know what you're looking for you can see the problems but on the basis of those videos generally they're very glossy slick and you get the impression that these are really really good machines I've not pulled any punches with this machine if I found a problem I've told you about it and I've tried to fix it in the best way possible now why is today the beginning of the end having recognized that this machine has now been brought up to a pretty good standard Cloudray have shown a serious interest in taking this very simple cheap machine and building basically a RUS spec machine in other words they want to include on a machine all the modifications that I've done to this so that they can sell a reliable good quality A grade tube and A grade power supply into the market at a, at a fairly economical price so you don't have to spend money twice buying a tube with the machine and buying another tube to upgrade it um, doing all the work that you've seen me do to upgrade pieces that aren't really very well designed and that's what we're just about to do we're going to rip this machine apart again and all my bits of plastic engineering which work fine are going to be turned into pieces of metal engineering I'm going to do the job properly so that I can send specifications to Cloudray with a view to them taking a machine and making it available as a good quality entry level machine. So as I go I will explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Now there are only a few major changes that need to be made to this machine. Not expensive changes but major changes that turn this from very ordinary into something nice and special and very usable. Now I love this machine, my stepdaughter loves this machine and I rarely get a chance to use this machine now because she spends most of her time on it with her new business venture. Now she's, she's doing bespoke coasters in glass and slate and table mat settings personalized images that can go onto these as well. This little machine has really been worked quite hard. The tube that's in the back is five years old and it's a 70 watt tube. Um, it's still working perfectly. How long it's going to go on for? Who can say? For the next couple of days this machine is going to be idle. So I'm taking this opportunity to jump in and make these modifications while I can. Now the first thing I've got here is a brand new number two mirror assembly. I know I've just put one on there but that was a temporary fix. This is the real metal version of that and as you can see we've got guides along the side here to keep the motion really nice and parallel when you adjust mirror two. Now in addition we've got this thing here and uh, uh, this is something to do with this belt which as you can see has got the teeth pointing outwards now that's not very standard nobody has the teeth turning outwards on a timing belt except Russ and that's for a very good reason now you will remember a long time ago when I was doing some test work I first identified a problem with this machine called curtains well that's what I called them curtains because basically what I've got in the bottom of this deep engraving here is basically the pattern of the teeth that are on the timing belt and after a lot of investigation I established that it was the teeth on the timing belt that I could see here and that's because the timing belt on this machine is driven by a very very small drive wheel it's only got 16 teeth on it and after investigation we found that those 16 teeth 
were basically a bit like driving a car with 16 flats on the tyre. Not a very comfortable ride and not a very uniform way of transmitting power. So I spent a year thinking about the problem and eventually I came up with this solution here. Now, as I've mentioned a few times before, my art teacher told me to make sure I take up plumbing. And you can see why. This is supposed to be a toothed wheel, the tooth drive pulley that I've just described. And here we've got the belt that goes around the drive pulley with its teeth on it. Hey, look, I'm not going to be drawing proper teeth, am I? Now, that was the cause of these curtains. At the other end of the belt on there, just an idler pulley with a plain surface on it. And I had lots and lots of people with their 3D printer saying, the solution to the problem is to change that wheel there. Make sure you turn that into a toothed belt. Well, my argument was very simple. If I've got a tire with eight flats on it on the front of the car, how is putting a tire with eight flats on it onto the back of the car gonna make it any better? I would say it's gonna make it worse. So that was not the proper solution to the problem. It took me a year to work out what a logical solution might be. And okay, so here is the logical solution that I devised. Plain wheel, plain wheel, and a plain idler pulley. The belt turned over with the teeth outwards, runs round these pulleys like this, and these press the belt onto the toothed wheel. So in effect, what we've got there now is a rack and pinion. But in this case, it's a flexible rack and pinion. Now, great as this solution was, I had one small fear. And that was the belt specification. Now the belt said that I should be using a minimum diameter of somewhere around about 40 or 50 millimetres diameter. These are 16. So I'm going to be putting lots of stress on this belt because I'm forcing it first one way, then another, and then round very sharp radiuses. So that was my only concern. It was longevity of the belt. But here we are, two years later, and my spare belt is still in the drawer. So, I worried unnecessarily. It completely fixes the curtains problem. And the other great advantage of it is, there is no mass to this system. I fixed a problem that was there in a massless way. Now, apart from the head, which is in itself a mass, there is nothing else in this system really. Let's just go and take a look at my other machine. On this machine, where I have just the merest hint of curtains at certain speeds, but basically nothing that's required me to take any drastic action. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, we've got more teeth on the final drive belt. And secondly, the motor has got the same tooth on it, but it's got an intermediate gear on it, which halves the ratio between the motor and the drive. So basically what that means is this stepper motor has got the ability to run twice as fast. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio between the motor and the belt. Now the great advantage of that is that running the stepper motor twice as fast means the inertia of the rotor in the stepper motor has less cogging effect. It's got much more smoothing effect. But the major advantage is that we've got a lot more teeth on here, at least three, probably two or three times as many teeth. But it has one major disadvantage, and that is mass, that's inertia. Look, not only have we got a big wheel on here, relatively speaking, and another big wheel on here, we've also got a big wheel on here, which is a flywheel in essence. So trust me, this is not that big a wheel. I have seen machines with wheels on that are probably two or three times that diameter to try and solve the same problem. 
Now that just means that there's no way that you can ever run a machine like that fast because you can take as much weight out of the head as you like but you've still got the inertia, the rotating inertia here. You know, if anybody's ever tried to stop a bicycle wheel or a flywheel with a hand, they will know how much energy and heat is generated just trying to stop it. I've done quite well to push this machine to its limits, but I could push that other machine faster than this machine because it has got so much less moving mass. So with such a low moving mass here, we can drive this machine quite hard. The motor itself is not very big, so there may be a limit to how fast we can drive this. I don't know how fast I can drive this because I've not pushed it to the limits. But after I've done these modifications, I do plan to see just how fast we can push this machine. So today's first task is to solidify this design because what I put on here was something I made by hand. This is something which I have designed, properly designed, hopefully, to do the job. And at the same time, I've tried to integrate and stiffen up the number two mirror mount so that it's tied into the stepper motor and it's completely solid. Now, the stepper motor itself could flex on its bracket, but hey, that's what this is for. This is to help stabilize the stepper motor and the mirror onto the main gantry. To make sure the mirror sits at the correct 45 degree angle, I've cut, I've laser cut these little tabs in here. Okay, now this is the correct way for the plate to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn the plate over and I'm going to very gently, <clears throat> I'm going to persuade these little tabs to bend up by roughly a millimetre. And there we go, we've got two location tabs there to make sure that the mirror can sit on there and is held at the correct angle 45 degrees. I managed to find this number one mirror assembly for about $16. Okay, one fixing screw, remove it, throw the rest away. And what we've got is a very nice L-shaped mirror adjusting system. Don't ever go for the triangular type. Always go for the L-type if you're looking for a mirror adjusting system. Okay, now this is going to sit against those tabs that I've just knocked up. And then we've got an M4 fixing screw underneath. Now, once the mirror is mounted on there, we should be able to eventually plug this onto here. And it gives us lots of Y adjustment, plus or minus six millimeters of Y adjustment. So here's where things are going to start to get a bit brutal. And I would suggest to anybody of a nervous disposition, uh, hide behind the sofa for the next half an hour because there's going to be some major surgery done on this machine. This bracket here, for example, as I've shown you before, is pretty flimsy. I can't remove the bracket because the bracket is part of the um, stepper motor assembly. But what I have got to do is to remove a big chunk of the bracket so that I can put my new bracket on. It's a little bit tricky getting to that one, but hey, we've got there. It's coming. And there we go, one bracket off. So we need to come through from the inside of the electrical cabinet with a screwdriver. And release the tension on the belt. Okay, so now, we can remove hmm, this bracket is actually fixed on under the screws of the uh, stepper motor. So I've got to loosen the stepper motor screws to 
and clamp this bracket. Now we shall have to remove one end of the timing belt. Well, I've undone the screws that were holding that and after two years those bearings are as good as new. So I'm going to reuse those again I think. Right, I think, I think I've got everything that I need just here. We're going to put a split spring washer onto that M5 by 30 long screw and then we're going to put a plain M5 washer underneath that stainless steel washer. We've got a little spacer on which we're going to sit three bearings like this and then on top of the pile we're going to put an M5 washer like that. Now I hope they're all going to fit in there. So I think we'll do this the other way around. We'll leave the washer, we'll leave the spacer till the end and we'll try and feed that stack onto the screw. First washer, first bearing, second bearing, and third bearing. And then once we've got those three bearings and a washer on there, we're going to lift the bottom bearing up. So we should now be able to slide the spacer underneath if the screw is up tall enough, if the screw is up high enough. And we might just lift it up a little bit more. And there we go. And I think we might have got the screw through the spacer as well. Ah, and now we've got to do exactly the same thing for this one and it's a little bit trickier this one because there's a little less room to get in. So there we have our nice st stack of bearings. Now there are four screws, one, two, three, four behind there, holding this onto the bearing. And I don't really want to disturb the squareness and trueness of that relationship. So what I've got to do is to cut this bracket off two or three millimetres above the bottom edge here. Now I think I've got a tool for doing that. Well here we go, eventually. Well it might have been weak in use but it was um, a bit of a bugger to get off. Now that screw there is easy enough to get to, but that one there, that's going to be an absolute pig. That bracket is now quite floppy look, so hopefully if I've got my dimensions right Yeah, they look about right. I should be able to fix that back onto there and that should lock the whole bracket up solid again. Right, it's looking good so far. Well I think we're just gonna have to go for it and take that screw out. One step of motor off. Now look at that for measurement, perfect fit. I've got to grind that bracket flush, I think. Now we go in with Deadly Weapon 2. The first problem solved. We've got the uh, we've got the bracket clear. So if we put the stepper motor back up. We'll put the light on this side so we can see what we're doing. Well, it's taken about half an hour of fiddling, but I've managed to get all the screws in, 
and I've got the belt in and fixed but I haven't tightened these up yet so the whole of this assembly here can be pushed forward to engage the teeth fully in the drive belt and then we'll lock this up and that keeps them fully engaged and now I can tighten up the stepper motor. Now that's a little bit difficult to do when the nuts are So if I can just jam the nut there, I can tighten that one up. I'm fairly confident I can tighten three of these up, but the fourth one, which is at the back left corner, is going to be a real pain. Yep, so that's three of those stepper motors. And look at that, it's absolutely rock solid now. There's going to be no mirror movement there at all. So I'm pretty pleased with that little bit of engineering. It locks everything up solid and gives me a nice platform to mount mirror two on. This is what I've been using on this machine for the last couple of years to lubricate the rails occasionally. Now I normally just paint it on on the top and bottom of the rail Having painted it on and run it back a few times, I then go along and wipe most of it off. Now, as soon as you turn the belt round you have to go into the vendor settings and you have to change the direction of the, the stepper motor and the keying direction as well because everything will be working backwards so the first time you switch it on it won't go to that sensor it'll go in the opposite direction so you have to be a little bit careful when you turn it on and the first thing you must do is probably press the escape button which stops everything in its tracks now what we've got to do is check with the position of the beam on mirror two. Now if I've got the design right then it shouldn't need adjustment in that direction it should only need adjustment in this direction. Well it's reasonable it's a little bit high it's a little bit out of line. Height we could change by a packing piece on here if we want to um, but I'm not going to touch much at the moment because technically I haven't changed Y so let's just check the alignment of Y that Y looks pretty good let's just, just have a quick check to see how our y-axis aligned so we'll just do a quick pulse there and then we'll do one at that end it's right over there so we've got to twist that and up and up a shade more and across a shade more wrong way Spot on more or less. I think that's about it. So that means now we've got to push the whole thing back a bit because it's too far forward. So all we've got to do is now loosen these two screws off, move the plate back a bit more. It's about it, central. Now we don't have to go too much more careful than that because we 
we've now got to check what happens down in Z. Now we haven't adjusted the head, so therefore, technically, we should still be perfectly lined up in Z. Not bad. So what we've got to do now is just check what we are, whether we're central. Just stick one of those on there. Look at that. Spot on. So we've got the machine back in working order by the look of it. Well, here we are at 400 millimeters a second. That's not looking bad. And if there was any sign of um, banding or curtains, you would see it in these dark areas here. And I don't see any hint of that, and there's certainly nothing across the pattern that indicates anything. So we're back in good working order. Okay, now this would normally take over 40 minutes to do at 200 millimeters a second, where I used to be able to print this. I'm now running it at 400 millimeters a second. I've pushed the power up from 12% to 18%, and I'm still getting excellent results. Now, the next step is to push this thing up to 800 millimeters a second. Now, I don't think anybody, anybody's ever tried running this machine at 800 millimeters a second. And we're gonna see what sort of results we get. Now, not really doing this properly. I really ought to have this on my, um, on my vacuum table to keep things nice and flat, but hey, it, it's not that crucial at the moment. We're only doing some experiments. 58% power because we're running so much faster. We've got to keep the dots the right colour. Now I've had to just decrease the acceleration from 30,000 down to 20,000 because when I was doing a quick dot test I lost steps is accelerating too fast. But the overrun on the end is still not huge for running so fast. So it's looking pretty good at 800 millimeters a second. The only thing is, as I said, we have definitely got scanning offset problems. Because if you look carefully at the whiskers here, you'll see that there are two whiskers, one going left and one going right. So we've got to fix the scanning offset and then, you know, maybe we can get this up to a thousand millimetres a second after all. Okay, so now we're going to see whether I can achieve my ultimate goal. A £40,000 machine for a thousand pounds. Thousand millimetres a second, photo engraving, 58% power. We've got an acceleration of 15,000 millimetres a second. I had to back it off from 30,000 because it was losing steps. We had to increase the focus to 12 millimetres and we've got a scanning offset of 0.5 millimetres. Well, here's my dream. We're photo engraving at 1,000 millimetres a second. fully wound up on this machine because I'm moving so fast I can't get the power into each dot. It may well be that 800 millimetres a second is actually better than a thousand millimetres a second. So that was a thousand millimetres a second and it's very fuzzy and indistinct. Now let me just go back and check whether or not we've got the correct dots and the correct focus. There's something wrong with the focus. That's why it's fuzzy. Well, what can I say? My dream has come true. Here we are, 
running the machine at 1,000 millimetres a second with a 254 GPI image, it's using full power at uh, probably close on 65-70 watts to slow down the acceleration to 15,000 millimetres a second. Um, so there's more over travel, uh, but that's purely because uh, I was losing a few steps when I was doing my setup tests. So it's not quite as distinct and clear as it was at slower speeds, but I suspect most people would be extremely happy with the quality that's coming out. There's no hints of banding on there at all, so we've absolutely got rid of the curtains effect. Too much detail down here, but that's because I think we're running so fast we just don't have the power to pull out all this very fine detail that should be down here. I suspect for normal engraving at a thousand millimetres a second this will work extremely well. But for photo engraving I think we've just jumped one step too far and we've fallen over a cliff. So that was a thousand millimetres a second, 85% power um, on a 70 watt tube so that was around about probably 65 watts coming out of the nozzle there. Um, we've got the compound lens in it's been set to 11.0 focus. It's got an acceleration of 100, uh, sorry, 15,000 millimeters per second squared. And it took 12 minutes, 43 seconds. There's the flexible rack and pinion in action. Now we're getting a lot more detail now. Look, we're getting the hairs down here. We're getting some decent hairs in the air here. And that lovely harsh noise tells me but we're hitting all the dots nice and hard. If it sounds soft and quiet, it's not doing the job properly. Well, actually, I think the 12 minutes, I think the 1,000 millimetres second is actually beating the 800 millimetres second. 800 millimetres second, 75% power, uh, I think it was 11.0 focus, Twenty-five thousand millimetres per second squared, it took 12 minutes, 12 seconds, in fact, I think that is probably fuzzier and worse than this one. I mean, the eyes are much sharper on this one. Everything is sharper except the whiskers. So, in terms of general quality, I would say that this one is probably even a 7 out of 10. So, we're going to try some normal engraving now at 1,000 millimetres a second. Now I've had to slow down the acceleration to 10,000 millimetres a second squared uh, because I was losing steps at this speed. So on balance it may be better to run at 800 millimetres a second with an acceleration of 20,000 which looks very doable. Is there any problem with the switching? And I don't think there's any problem with my scanning offset. I seem to have that set pretty well. 
nice crisp detail, not fuzzy around the edges. Now to achieve this level of crispness with the compound lens, you've got to have the focus set very accurately, probably within a point around about 0.2 of a millimetre. So you must carry out the dot test first to get the thinnest possible line and the best focus. It's set to about 11 or 11.1. .1. And to achieve that level of flatness, um, you really need something like my vacuum table here, which allows me to not only hold the material dead flat, but it allows me with a three-point location system to set it absolutely flat. So I think my dream has actually become reality. You are seeing engraving at a thousand millimeters a second. Now, as I've said to you before, this card, this beer mat card that I'm using is basically pure wood pulp. It's grainless wood. There's no china clay in it. It's, it's as close to pure wood as you could possibly get. So I think I can probably say mission accomplished. Right, so I think this is the end of part one where I've made two major modifications to the machine. First of all, we've changed away from the um, very unsatisfactory mirrors that were on there originally and we've gone for a decent 25mm diameter mirror system. We've mounted the mirror system on a Y-axis that is completely controllable and adjustable and we've also turned the belt over to get rid of curtain and we've turned this into a flexible rack and pinion system now. So there's two significant changes that we've made to the machine. The third and the fourth one effectively we've already dealt with. This is one of the changes. We changed to a C series lens tube which allows us total flexibility for all sorts of lenses, lens combinations and we've also changed the head for a very lightweight head. So there's nothing hanging on that head as you can see. We've got no red dot pointer and we've got no autofocus system. Suits me. Change number five I made a long time ago which is to cover up the aluminium base plate with a sheet of 1.5 thick cold rolled mild steel. Now that does two things. First of all, it reduces the reflection. Aluminium's around about 99% and steel, especially in its uh, scrubbed up form, uh, has got a, a, a reflection of around about 70% which is still quite a lot of reflection, but by the time you hit the surface and it gets, it's got like an orange peel surface, you get all sorts of diffusion of the beam. And so consequently, if you lift your work a few millimeters, maybe 10 millimeters above the surface, the diffusion does not cause too much damage to the back of your work. Now, change number six, which was done very early on, was to put spaces in the corner of the cover so that when you close the lid, it doesn't close. What you've got, you've got an air gap along the front here, which allows air into the machine. But not only does it allow air into the machine, it allows it in, in the form of a jet of air. Now that jet of air flows across the top of your work normally, and goes out through the big extraction, six inch extraction, that is the back there. Now, normally, the machine comes with a fan, which probably wouldn't even blow soap bubbles away. So what we've had to do is to manage the airflow through this machine with a much more powerful fan. Now although it's six inches diameter into the fan, it's only four inches diameter out of the fan. So it doesn't require a large duct out to the outside world. Now I often use the term air management because it is a crucial part of the design of this machine which, to be fair, I think probably 99% of laser machines take no heed of at all. But it is very important that you control the flow through your machine. You want the air to flow across your work, whether it be over or under your work. You don't want it hanging around in the, in the enclosure because if you hang around in the enclosure 
then when you finish the job and you open it up, you get fumes coming out at you. You don't want to be in that position. You want the fumes to be extracted away as soon as possible. And by having a jet of air blowing across your work or underneath your work like this, you can control where the air goes in your machine. Now, in my case, it goes out the back there. And in the case of this machine, even though it's got a few <laughs> attempts at letting air into the machine through the grill, I've still got my sheet of air underneath here. Look, I've got a one inch spacer under there that allows air to go in. It goes right across the table and out through those series of vents at the back there because it's being sucked over the back of the table. And just at the back there, there is a six inch duct which pulls the air away. But I've covered that duct over with a very large, cheap filter material which collects all the sticky fumes from MDF and acrylic and stops them going in and blocking up my very expensive Purex filter. It cost me less than a pound to replace that filter whereas it cost me something like about 60 or 80 pounds to replace the same filter in my Purex unit. So that filter has been on there for probably something like a couple of months now and it's already picked up quite a lot of crud as you can but see. The point is we're managing the airflow across the machine what happens to it under here is relatively unimportant because this effectively becomes a vacuum chamber and the vacuum that's in here is sucking air down through those vents at the back there. But those vents at the back there will do nothing on their own. So just having suction at the back of the machine is of no value at all really. Let me give you a quick demonstration as to why this piece at the front here, the gap, the sheet of air that comes into the machine is the most important part of the whole of this air management system. So look, here I am, I'm going to be about six inches away from that candle I'm flame. With it, and I'm going to suck as hard as I can. Am I making any difference to that candle flame? No. No matter how much I suck, I can't really influence it. But look, I'm going to blow very gently on it. Can I make the point any stronger than that? This blowing from here is forcing air across the machine in a controlled manner. It's like me blowing. Having the lid open or having the air sucking from anywhere else will have no effect at all. Air will naturally migrate into this suction zone here from anywhere and everywhere and not necessarily in a controlled manner. This gap across the front here is the controlled manner. It's the managed airflow that you want through your machine. So whoever designed this machine originally had no concept of airflow management. We've produced a vacuum chamber there. You cannot evacuate smoke from a vacuum chamber. You must have through flow to get smoke away from the work area. Now, you need to add one more thing to that and that's to manage the through flow. And that's effectively what I'm asking them to do here. So what they realistically should do is make this lid maybe 20 to 25 millimeter shorter so that we finish up with an air gap through here to let air in. Taking this off does not solve the problem. This is just a cover to make it look pretty. Behind this cover is access to the tensioning system for the Y belts at the end here. Well I think that's been a pretty successful part one. We've done some major modifications and we've achieved a thousand millimeters a second. Something I never thought I'd ever see on this machine. Now, for normal engraving, now I've got used to looking at this machine, I'm not so sure that it's as fast as it will go. It could well go faster. As I go faster, I've got to reduce the acceleration, and that means it takes longer to do the same job. But I've got this feeling that something like 800 millimeters a second with a 20,000 millimeters per second acceleration may well actually finish up as a slightly faster cycle time than the thousand millimeters a second with 10,000 acceleration. Now in part two we're going to be changing the tube mount. 
Now the tube mount has already got a combined mirror one included but I'm changing it away from my plastic acrylic construction to a more durable steel construction. And we're also going to be taking a little bit of a closer look at the air assist system that I've designed for this machine which is switchable and controllable. So until then thanks for your time and patience and I'll catch up with you in the next session.